1 John chapter number 2, in verse number 18 again. It's a problem when I go off the beaten path and I go against what I'm supposed to be doing. I start to try to get smart and my smarts prove themselves, in quotation marks, prove themselves. 1 John 2, verse number 18. Everybody sit back down. Why don't you stand up and we'll... Uh... <laughs> He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, you're right about that. 1 John 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They, that is those Antichrists, those false teachers, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But if the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. Let's pray, Lord. We need to know the truth. We, we need to understand what the truth is. We understand the principle or the idea that truth comes from you. Truth is your word. Every bit of it is truth. And so help us to understand that fact. And Lord, may it guide how we make our decisions, how we understand your word. May we know that it is all truth. There's not a bit of error mixed in there. So keep us, please, from human error, from our own ideas, or from what somebody else has said about it. Lord, may we take it for what it says and understand what it means. We understand that's what the Holy Spirit can do in and through us. So we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that that comes at salvation. And we pray that you'd give us uh, understanding tonight that we might grow uh, by it. And again, if there's someone here today that isn't saved, then we pray that tonight might be the night they might trust Christ as Savior and make that issue settled once and for all and forever. And we'll be grateful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing again. You may be seated. Well, we started this last week, and, and we kind of uh, went through a majority of the message, I guess I would say. Uh, and we, we talked about uh, this issue of truth and how John is is promoting truth. He's helping us understand how important the truth is. And regardless of what somebody says, well, this is true. The, the issue is, is, does it come from God's Word? Is, is it uh, an issue that God has said something about? And if so, then what God has said about it is true. And anything contrary to that is obviously lie or is, is untrue. And so we, we made mention of the fact that sometimes people will say things like it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you love others and as long as you're sincere about it or as long as you, you think that's what it means, as long as you're sold about it, then that's really what truth is. But it's, it's not enough to just say, well, this is what I think. The issue is, is am I walking in truth and is it in the light of God's truth? It's not just walking in the light alone. It's not just walking in love alone. I must walk also in the truth of God's Word. And so in the passage, and we, we looked at it a little bit last week, that John emphasizes the seriousness of this matter of knowing what the truth is, of, of holding fast to the truth. And he introduces kind of two concepts to get us to understand this is, this is important for you and I to, to understand or to know. And he, he gives us those two concepts right there in verse number 18. He says, first of all, it is the last time. 
Time is drawing short, and, and uh, the Lord is, is coming back soon. And so because of that, and by the way, if John understood that to be true, then how much closer are we today? Hello. Uh, the last time began when Christ left this earth, and the angels looked down and said, you men, why stand you gazing up into heaven? As he left, he's going to come back in the same manner. Well, it's the last time, John says, and because of that, you have to understand, we're, we're dealing with a time of crisis. And in that time of crisis, he says, here's concept number two, ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists. Okay, so it's a time of crisis, and John says, in this time of crisis, we need to guard against the error of the enemy. And what we mentioned, there's a couple of meanings for that word anti when John uses that in anti-Christ. It can mean either against Christ or in opposition to, or it can mean in, in, instead of. So if I'm setting myself up as instead of Jesus, meaning, well, I know what Jesus has written and I know this is God's word, but here I have this other thing that I want to show you or share with you or, or, or give to you and it's also truth. No, no, that is a spirit of antichrist. That is not actually the truth. And so the, the passage explains to us, John is telling his readers that there are two forces at work in our world today. Number one, truth is working in the lives of believers through the Holy Spirit. All right? Because I have the Holy Spirit, I can understand what truth is, but there's also evil. And evil is working by the power of Satan. And so John says, and we'll look at this here in just a moment, John says that, okay, I have the truth. The truth is this book. All right? And because I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, I can understand what this book says. And so when I see error coming down at me or when, when somebody is speaking something that is in error, then what I do is I use God's Word and the Holy Spirit working in me to say, no, what you're saying, what you're, you're propagating, what you're trying to preach to me is not truth because it doesn't match up with what this book says. Right? And so John says, because it's crisis time, because antichrists are out there, you and I need to value the truth. And so he does it in a couple of ways here, and this is where we were last week. John is going to give us a contrast between the, the spirit of antichrist, or those, those who are acting as an antichrist, and those who are God's true children. And he says, like verse number 19, antichrists are going to depart from the fellowship. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Why? Because we're giving the truth. And because if they value the truth, they're going to stay where the truth is. But if they don't have the truth, and uh, when they try to give their false teaching or give their error, and it is rejected, then what do you think they're going to do? Well, they're going to either, one, try to cause trouble and problem, and leave, or they're just going to leave and find someone else who is not, uh, uh, not as uh, discerning in those areas of truth. And so they're going to find somewhere else. And so John says, there were some even in our own congregations that uh, were, were not of the truth. They were not of us. They went out from us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And we, we said, we made reference last week, I think John is, is remembering Judas Iscariot. He's one of the twelve, but he ain't one of the twelve. He's in the group, but he is sent away because he is not of the truth. So Antichrist, depart from the fellowship. Secondly, Antichrist then, he says in verse 22, Antichrist, deny the faith. Who is a liar? Or there is, this is the ultimate lie. But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Third, he says in verse 26, Antichrist attempt to deceive the faithful. These things, he says, have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you or try to pull you away. All right, so then let's look at the other side of the coin, and that's where we kind of finish up this message tonight then is, okay, we've seen the Antichrist and what they do, but then on the opposite end of the Antichrist are true Christians and people who are committed to the truth of God. And, and the contrast that John gives us here in the, in the chapter is, is such a strong one. The Christians are those who walk in truth, and they are opposed at every, every station by the Antichrist who are propagating these spiritual lies. So one hand, you've got truth. The other hand, you've got the lie. 
And there's not really any in-between territory there. Either I'm for the truth or I'm, I'm teaching a lie. I'm teaching something that's opposed to what God has said. So the true Christian, John says, is not going to be deceived by the Antichrist, by the false teachers, because they are, verse 24, they're abiding in the truth of God. Let that, therefore, he says, abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So what is abiding? If you remember, we kind of finished here last week. Abiding is just remaining in fellowship. Uh, so John says, remain in fellowship with God's Word. Remain in fellowship with, with God the Son. Remain in fellowship with God the Father. Remain in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Allow those, those entities to work in you to help you to discern when error comes at you. When there's false teaching that comes up, when somebody says something and says, man, that doesn't really sound right. I've never really heard that before. Usually when I've never heard that before, that's like a red flag that says, hey, buddy, uh, you might uh, pay attention here because Solomon even said there's nothing new under the sun. And uh, God's given discernment not just to us in our modern day and not just to the television preacher who sells books. No, no, he's given it to all kinds of good men and women before us who have helped us to understand some things from God's Word. And when somebody says, well, I've got something new that you've probably never heard before, I immediately put the radar up. And the shield goes up and like, uh, yeah, but if it doesn't match up to that book, it ain't true. Right? So again, John is trying to help us understand there's truth that's out there. It's been around. You need to abide in that truth. It'll help you to discern when error comes at you. So what are some, some ways that that happens? Well, he says, number one, believers, verse 20, have the Holy Spirit to guide us. Notice verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now, that word unction in verse 20, it's a great word. It, it means an anointing. Uh, it, it was uh, synonymous with, with oil, similar to what uh, maybe the, the, the king of Israel might be. He would be anointed or a, a prophet who came on the, the scene that, that God had, had called into service. That, that would be, they would be anointed or set apart for God's use. So John says, if you've trusted in Christ, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And what he's saying is that the, the anointing that you have is not some weird mystical thing. The anointing, that the unction that you have is the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. You have God dwelling in and among you. He will guide you into truth. Now, hold your place in 1 John, and I want you to turn back to the Gospel of John. Hold your place in 1 John, look back at the Gospel of John, John chapter 14. John 14... Look at verse 26. Again, the setting. We, we were here this morning just briefly. The, the setting, once again, is Jesus is telling his disciples that he will be uh, soon going into heaven. He'll be crucified. He'll be buried. He'll rise again. And then he will leave them to return to his heavenly Father. And so they're troubled, of course. Well, he says in verse 26, these are words to comfort. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall, what's the word? Teach you. He shall teach you all things. It's the same phrase that he uses back in 1 John 2. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, go a couple of chapters or one chapter over, well, a couple of chapters, chapter 16. Look at chapter 16. All of this is the same kind of discourse that he's giving to these disciples. Uh, look at verse 1, John 16. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be, what? Offended. If you're in Sunday school this morning, we talked about great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. And the issue there, as well as here, is, is, uh, has the idea of being tripped up or deceived in some things. All right. So John, said, John is saying, he's repeating these words from Christ, and he says, these things am I, I'm talking to you about, I've spoken unto you that ye should not be offended, that you won't be tripped up, that you'll know what the truth is. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you would think that he doeth God's service. 
And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me, whither, so, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. It's a good word. It means it's best. Right? It is expedient for you. Now listen to what Jesus says. It's expedient for you that I go away. Now, anybody want the Lord to leave them? No. But notice why he says this. For if I go not away... The Comforter, who's the Comforter? Holy Ghost, we read that in chapter 14. The Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of, there's our word again, truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So John, the same man that wrote this epistle of 1 John, is giving these not just promises, but facts to every believer. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, Jesus himself said that because he is gone, he has sent another comforter, that is the Holy Ghost, to indwell each and every one of us. You don't have to pray for a second blessing. Uh, We we don't believe in such a thing as uh, uh, getting the full gospel. Well, you trust Christ, yeah, but you need to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon you. What John says in 1 John chapter 2 is, if you're saved, you already have it. It doesn't come in some special revival service or you don't get to some, speak in some weird language. By the way, do you understand this? God understands English as well as any other language. Good gravy. I get so tired of hearing, well, I've received a special language. Why do you need a special language? Why don't you just draw close to God in English? He understands that. He understands that. He understands Swahili. He understands German. He understands Spanish. He understands it all. I don't draw closer to him because I have some, I speak gibberish. That's foolishness. And John says, it is very simple. You can know him. You can know the truth. Why? Because he dwells within you if you've trusted in him. He will show you what the truth is. Remember what the view of the Gnostics was that John is trying to combat here in 1 John. The Gnostics believed that uh, because of their knowledge or because of their wisdom or because of what they had gained, they had a special, and in fact they even used the word unction or a special knowledge of God Himself. And so because of that, they believed that they were set apart from the regular church folks, the regular church family, because they had a better understanding of who God was and what His Word had to say. That they could understand more than the average bear, so to speak. And John says, "Uh, that's not the truth. If they speak anything against what this Word says, by the way, which is available to anybody... If they speak anything against what this word says, they are antichrist. John tells us, don't be deceived by those. The Holy Spirit within us already uses God's word to teach us what we need. And so, again, back in verse number 20, ye have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One. That's the Holy Ghost. And because of that, just like he said in John 14, just like he said in John 16, ye know all things. Now, all right, question. Do you know everything? (laughs) No. No. It's pretty obvious. He doesn't mean everything in all the world. You're not a walking encyclopedia. 
use the context. Let's use proper interpretation skills of our Bible to understand what's being talked about. What's the context here? We're talking about the truth of knowing our salvation. That's the, the kind of overarching uh, uh, theme of First John. So you will know all things pertaining to what God desires you to know, what, what God has given to you. You can understand everything that God has given you already. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will give you understanding in those things. We will know the truth of God's Word. We will be able to discern the errors and lies of these antichrists, these false teachers. We can find everything you need to know. We can find everything that, that we would ever need from God's Word. Question, did the Holy Spirit inspire the writing of God's Word? Yes, yes. So if the Holy Spirit gave the inspiration, and we understand that from 2 Timothy chapter number 3, from 1 Peter, uh, if we believe that the Holy Spirit gave inspiration to holy men of God, then don't you think that the Holy Spirit of God can give you and I understanding of what His Word means? Amen, I sure do. Oh, well, good. We have one who is listening and paying attention. Yes, yes. If the Holy Spirit gave the Word, the Holy Spirit can give understanding of what the Word says. By the way, John 16 and verse number 13, we read it. He will lead you into all truth. He will help you to understand what the Bible says. Okay, well, Pastor, there are some times when I read my Bible and I don't understand what it says. Join the club. There are some things I come across like, man, I don't know. Huh. I might have to do some study on that. Well, what do you think God wants me to do? Just bypass and say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. No, no. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, complete, so I need what God's Word says. So when I come to one of those passages that is a little bit difficult for me to understand or, or that I need some help with, do I have anyone that I might be able to ask for help? Oh, this is a live group tonight. Yes, you do. He's called God. Oh, this is, this is just connecting very well. I can tell. So... I have to be diligent in my study. I have to be, here's a good word, I have to be patient. <laughs> well, maybe I won't get it on the first time I read it. Maybe I won't get it on the first ten times I read it. Uh, maybe it might take a hundred times of me kind of reading through something, and then um, God might help me in some way by taking me across another passage of Scripture and say, oh, that's what that means. Sometimes he uses um, a preacher or an evangelist or a friend to come along and preach a message or to, to give a word of encouragement or to say, hey, have you ever seen this verse? And you start to connect the dots. Well, that ain't you connecting the dots. That's God doing that in you. He's helping you to understand those things. So be diligent. Be patient. Ask for God's help to and apply things like sound biblical principles of interpreting your Bible. That is, let your Bible interpret your Bible. We're not bound by some preconceived notion. Well, here's what I've, I've always been taught, and so I'm just going to put that idea onto the Bible, and it must mean this. Not always. <laughs> not always. See what the Bible says. Sooner or later, those difficult passages begin to connect, and they begin to make sense. Again, I don't have to pray for some special anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, John says you already have the Holy Spirit to guide you. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. So in 1 John 2 and verse number 20, is he only writing to the pastors of the church? No. He's writing to everyone. You have it right now. And so verse 21, he kind of continues the thought. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So John's saying, you, you people, you've been taught the truth. You, you've trusted in the truth, and they know that, that there is something that, that cannot be both true and false or true and error at the same time. All right? That's what he's saying at the very end. No lie is of the truth. So if it's true, it's not a lie. 
Now hold on. If it's a lie, it ain't true. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I know, pretty, pretty amazing. But think about it. If it's untrue, it's untrue. If it's true, it's true. Lies come from Satan. John 8, 44, the very same man writes that Satan is the father of lies. Truth is from God. It is narrow in nature. That's one thing I love about truth is it is very narrow in nature. It, it finds an absolute and it sticks to the absolute. If it changes, it ceases to be truth. But here's what error is. Error is not narrow in nature. Error, error is... It takes anything and everything. It takes all kinds of different views. And error uh, changes depending on either who I'm talking to or uh, what I want to uh, portray by this, this message that I'm trying to give. Or um, here's one. You ever told a lie? And then try to remember the lie that you told so you didn't get in trouble more? <laughs> yeah, I've done that a couple times. Like a couple hundred times, seems like. And then I forgot the lie that I said. Why? Because it's error. And I got, I got mixed up trying to remember what the stupid lie was. And I would have been much better off if I just would have told the truth. Now, when I was a kid and my parents said, you know what, you would have been better off if you just would have told the truth. In my mind, I'm like, not really. I would have gotten in trouble anyway. <laughs> but then I became a parent. And I can't stand being lied to. And when I catch my little blessings in a lie, man, I want to... Why do you lie? You're getting in worse trouble because you lied. Why? Because I want, to, I want to teach them to value what the truth of the matter is. Listen, if you mess up, own it. Just own it. Don't, don't lie and, and, and engage error in your life. But truth is narrow in its nature. It recognizes one absolute. Error is varied. It can be twisted to accommodate almost anything. Truth does not compromise. While error is willing to accept all kinds of variations and twists and turns. You've probably heard some of the stories of um, some of our school system and, and uh, some of the issues with, uh, you know, even like math class. What is two plus two, kids? It's four, right? Four. Two plus two is four. Two plus two is not five. It is not ten. Two plus two is not a hundred. It never changes. But in, in some views, it's, it's, uh, we're trying to uh, give what, what might be called relative truth. Well, if that's what you think, then that's okay. That is not okay. Um... I can't go to the bank. I've tried it. You can't go to the bank and give them $2 and say, I want to add this to my bank account, and they give me $5 instead. It doesn't happen that way. You know what they give me? $2. That's what I have. They deposit $2 into my bank account. I don't go and say, oh, man, they gave me 100 bucks. Glad there's relative truth. <laughs> No, no. Truth is truth. It doesn't change. It's, it's narrow in its scope. Uh, Jesus said in John 17, in verse number 17, after he gets done teaching those disciples that we looked at in 14 and 16, in chapter 17, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he is praying. Here's what he prays. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Make them special. Sanctify them through thy truth. You know how he finished that verse? Thy word is truth. You know how you're made to be special? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you and He uses His Word to make you something special to God. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So believers, John says, first of all, they have the Holy Spirit for guidance. It has been given to every believer. Secondly, John says in verse number 23, that believers accept the truth of who Christ is. Notice what he says, verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. 
Now, Antichrist may not deny the Father, and we, we talked a little bit about that last week, but they certainly deny the truth of Jesus Christ. And John says, anyone who denies Christ does not have the Father. But when you, you acknowledge the truth about Jesus Christ, when you place your trust in that truth about Him, as these that He is writing to have done, you truly can have the Father. You can't have one without the other. Okay? You can't have the Father without the Son. By the way, I think I read that somewhere. Oh yeah, the Bible. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. I can't get to the Father. I can't have relationship with God at all unless I come through Jesus Christ the Son. So, okay, we... We have the Holy Spirit to guide us. We accept the truth of who Christ is. Is there some tools of defense then that we can use against these antichrists or against these false teachers? Yes, there is. John tells us, beginning in verse number 24, John says, number one, and it's not anything different, but you've been given the Word of God. Use the Word of God in, in defense of those false teachers. When somebody comes at you, check what they're saying against the filter of God's Word. So look at verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. So what's the, what have they heard from the beginning? Well, the preaching, the teaching of God's Word. Right? The truth of the gospel, the teaching of the apostles that, that brought them to faith in Christ, that grew them in their Christian walk, and in even the fuller sense, as, as we understand on this side of, of this epistle, uh, in, in our modern day, it not only includes the, the original apostolic teaching, it also includes the full canon of God's Word, Genesis to Revelation. Right? Um, 2 Timothy 3 doesn't say, well, um, the, the major prophets are good and profitable. It doesn't say, well, the Gospels are the only thing you listen to. It doesn't say, well, uh, just listen to First and Second Timothy and Titus, or just listen to Paul's epistles. It says, all. We don't have to play word gymnastics. All means all. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So that which you've heard from the beginning includes the message of the gospel, yes, but it's the entire teaching of God's Word. We are to let the Word abide in us, John says. And as we let it abide in us, it will be used to guide us and form us to be conformed in the image of Christ. So, okay, let me just ask a very simple question. Can you become more Christ-like? Can you walk closer with the Lord and become more knowledgeable about God's will by spending time away from God's Word? <laughs> no. That doesn't even make sense. I'm going to learn more about God by going out into the woods. Well, you might learn more about bugs and get eaten by mosquitoes, but you ain't going to learn more about God. All right? You're going to learn more about God by reading what He has said and revealed about Himself in His Word. Right? As much as I love the outdoors, you're not, it's, it's not going to happen. Right? I don't learn more about God at Walmart. I learn about how He helps me to keep my mouth shut, but I don't necessarily learn more about Him. Right? I need to be in His Word. Now, um, we, we've referenced this verse a couple times, but look back at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy 3. Just a few pages left. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And verse 14. 2 Timothy 3, 14. But, what's the next word? Continue. Abide. Con keep on. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known what? Holy Scriptures. Question. Are we talking about uh, the New Testament here with Timothy? No. No. He didn't have that. We have that now. We're talking about Old Testament Scriptures. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Like Genesis through Malachi. You, you've had those things, and those things which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Wait a minute, the Old Testament? Yes! 
Yes! Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. John says, how do you defend yourself against these antichrists, against these false teachers? It begins right here in God's Word. It's profitable. This, this book will help you, and all of this book will help you. That, that's why David would say, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. Uh, um, blessed is that man that, that uh, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? In the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall what? Prosper. Because he's a good person? No, because he's in God's word. And he's allowing God's word to, to multiply in his life, to minister to him. So not only do you need the word of God, but then in verse number 27, John says once again, you also need the Holy Spirit and his ministering work in your heart and in your life. Look again back in 1 John chapter number 2. Look at verse 27. Same, same idea as verse uh, number 20, verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Again, in the super Christian? No, in any Christian. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Okay, so is knowing the truth, is just knowing what the Bible says, is that enough? No. No, I would say that the false teachers knew what the Bible said. They were in the church. They heard the same preaching. They knew what the Bible said. The issue is they weren't allowed the Holy Spirit to do the work. They didn't have the Holy Spirit because they weren't trusting in what God's Word had to say. They weren't trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation. What made the difference in John's audience, what makes the difference in your life and in my life if we're saved, is that we have the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And so in verse number 27, John is not saying, when he says, you need not that any man teach you, he's not saying that there's no value in human teaching. That's not, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying that we shouldn't listen when someone is trying to preach or stand before us to minister the Word of God. After all, what is John doing when he's writing this? He's teaching them. Right? So he's not saying there's no value in that. It means that any valid, any useful teaching or any useful instruction to God's people must be done by those who are also saved. Right? And those who are also abiding in the Word of God and in God's wisdom and direction for their life. Right? Um, that's why we don't just bring any old person in here to preach. It's important. We need to know that they are saved and that they dwell in God's Word so that God can use them to speak to our hearts. All right? We don't just pull someone off the street and say, hey, would you preach a message for us? By the way, um, that is a heavy responsibility for a pastor or an evangelist or any preacher. You better be abiding in God's Word if you're going to stand before God's people and preach His Word and His truth. Because it's not about you. It's about what the Holy Spirit uses you to do. So if believers are confronted with false teaching of unbelievers or of false prophets or false teachers, those abusing the Scripture to teach their own doctrine, to push their own agenda, then they have something, John says, you have something within you, a means of searching God's Word and discerning between truth and error. You remember those Bereans in the book of Acts? Searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So they came into the, the preaching, they listened to Paul speak God's Word and preach, and then they would get out their scroll or their, their copy of some Old Testament passage, or they would maybe go to the synagogue and pull the scroll, and they would look through God's Word and say, is that really what the truth is? And they would search and to seek. And if it matched up, okay, I'm putting my trust in what he's saying then. If not, that's false, it's error. I'm not going to believe that. 
D.L. Moody was a tremendous preacher. He wasn't very highly educated, but God used him greatly. He said this, and I thought it was a tremendous statement. Listen to this. The best way to show that a stick is crooked is not to argue about it or to spend time denouncing it, but to lay a straight stick alongside of it. The best way for me to tell if something is truth or error is to lay truth right alongside it. Is that, does that line up with what truth says? And if it doesn't, throw it out. It's, it's not good. Truth matters. Yes, we should live righteously. Yes, we should walk in the light. Yes, we should, we should love other people. In fact, John says those are some of the tests to, to help us to get assurance of our salvation. But we also must stand firmly for what the truth of the matter is. Truth as revealed in Christ is its objective. I, that's why I, I appreciate it. It's, a, it's an objective truth. It is not subjective in its nature. It provides a basis for, for making judgments. It, it provides a, a help for, for revealing error around us. So you know what antichrists and false teachers usually try to do? They usually try to get you away from God's Word. They try to pull you away. Well, listen to this message. Listen to this. Read this book. This will help you. <laughs> no, no. If it's not here, I don't want to listen to what it says. Right Now again, can there be good help and commentaries? Do we have books in our bookstore that are helpful? Yes. You know why they're helpful? Because they contain principles from God's Word. Right? God's used some authors to, to be a help and to give us some understanding of some of these things through, again, the Holy Spirit's help in every one of our, our lives. But I'd be very wary when somebody wants to turn me away from the Word of God towards someone else, towards something else. Well, again, I have something new, or, or this is a new revelation. No, no, God's given us what I need. God is big enough and knows enough to know that I would need what He said in His Word in 2018, just like He gave it in 1000 B.C. or uh, 30 A.D. He's big enough to know all that. Truth is important. As we, verse 28, as we abide in Christ and we follow His truth, then He says what He does in verse number 29. Uh, if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born in Him. Our deeds are changed. So verse 28, and now little children abide in Him. That when He shall appear, we may have, and here's a great word, we may have confidence. Confidence. And not be ashamed before Him at His coming. I follow His truth. I abide in Him. I allow His Word and, and the Holy Spirit to abide in me. I can have confidence. I am saved. He, he's working in me. He's helping me to understand this. And then my deeds, verse 29, will turn to righteousness. I will be walking in the light because I know what the light is. Truth matters. It's important. It's important what you believe. It's not just, well... You know, you can believe that and I can believe this. No, no. God's given us what we, we need to be understanding, what we need to be hiding in our heart, in our life, how we need to be living our life. Now, that's an old antiquated book. Well, it was written a long time ago, but man, this thing is so relevant. <laughs> it is so helpful. Goodness. You're going to come across something tomorrow at your workplace, in your family, in your relationship with your spouse, or, or someone else that you come in contact with, I'm, I'm telling you, you can gain truth out of this book that will help you in that situation. It will help you to say the right thing. It might keep you from saying the wrong thing. This book is, is, is wonderful. Are you letting it abide in you? Are you walking in the light of the truth?